Last week, uh, we talked about the pride test. The week before that, the purpose test. And um, I, I hope that you are getting something out of this because I know as teachers how difficult it must be to know that uh, life for all of us is a series of tests. I know that brings you great comfort as, as teachers. Uh, today, we are going to talk about one of the more familiar uh, passages in this, in this story, uh, and that is um, Joseph's life in the pit, all right? And we're going to talk about that pit test uh, today. Uh, here's what I know about all of us. All of us will encounter pits in this life. We know, probably all know what uh, a pit is, that place that we find ourselves in that we don't want to be in that feels empty, that feels um, isolated from others. It's a hard place to be in. Um, and, and yet it's important that we understand uh, how, or it is, it is very important that we understand that we must have the right response in these times uh, that we find ourselves in the pit. Because our response in the pit will determine, number one, how long we stay there. Um, and, and that's a pretty big deal because I don't think we want to camp out in a pit too long. Um, our response in the pit determines where we will go from, from there. Um, so, so what's going to happen when you get out? Well, a lot of times um, just be a reflection of your attitude while you were in the pit. And third, uh, our character moving forward because pits truly do shape us. They shape our character. They shape our attitudes. Uh, and so where, what our character will be like moving forward. I want to read to you a pretty lengthy passage this morning out of Genesis 37, uh, beginning with verse 13. And uh, hang with me on this, sort of, sort of follow along if you have your Bible or Bible app. Uh, if not, you'll, you'll know the story. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent off from the valley of Hebron. Then when Joseph arrived in Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered, and I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in a distance, and before, they, or before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him throw him into one of these cisterns and say that, for, that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern or the pit here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from, from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe that he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty because there was no water in it. This, this part of the story reminds me of um, that, that man who was walking. Uh, every night he would walk to work or walk home from work. And... Um, <sighs> You know, after a long day's work, it's late at night, he would, he would often choose the shortcut to get home through the cemetery. And um, sort of a spooky walk, right? And, and yet it would cut about 15 minutes off of his, of his time. Uh, so he would often choose the shortcut of the, of the cemetery to walk home. And one night when he was walking through the cemetery, um, uh, without him knowing the 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 grave or, or the um, uh, attendants had been out that day uh, digging a fresh grave, and uh, he found himself in a in a freshly dug grave that wasn't there the night before, and and he tried for for a couple of hours to to get out of this this grave, um, and finally he just said, "Man, I'm I'm just gonna." 
sleep here. And uh, when I wake up in the morning, surely the groundskeepers will be around. They'll hear me, hear me yelling, and they'll, they'll help me get out. And uh, so he just kicked back, took a little nap, and waited for the next day. And uh, during, the, during the course of that time, there was this drunk fella that came stumbling into the cemetery. And um, uh, he, he fell into that same grave. And uh, he, he tried to get out tried to get out, and uh, about the time that he was going to give up, uh, the man who was already there put his hand on his shoulders and said, hey, buddy, you can't get out of here. But he did. <laughs> I, I think you can get out of any pit if you are properly motivated. And if you're in a freshly dug grave and a hand touches you and a voice calls out, you find a way to get out of that grave, right? Um, but, but we can get out of any pit if we are properly motivated. And I want to give you three questions uh, that, that I hope you'll be motivated with when you find your life in, in, um, or you find yourself in a, in a pit in this, in this life. And the first question is this, how did you get there? Uh, it, is, it is always a wise thing for us to take inventory any time in life, but especially when we find ourselves in a pit. Sometimes we are in pits that were not of our own making. Um, that can be very, very frustrating. Um, we didn't want to be there. We didn't ask to be there, but we find ourselves there. Uh, it, it happens. Um, but, but sometimes, and a lot of times, I think probably most of the time when we find ourselves in pits, we're in pits of our own making, right? And um, it's, it's important that when we get in the pit that we don't find ourselves blaming others, uh, but that we truly do some soul searching and ask ourselves, why, why are we there? Jacob, or, or Israel, um, said, said to Joseph, go check on your brothers. Think, think about this for a minute. Um, Joseph really, or, or, or Jacob didn't need Joseph to, to go check on his brothers. All of his brothers that were out in the fields were older than him. The oldest were in their 40s. They were in a big group. Um, they, they really didn't need Joseph to check on them. Uh, but, but what Jacob was saying is, um, hey, uh, I, I, I really see how your brothers hate you. I want you to have some bonding time with your, with your brothers. Um, and so he sent, he sent Joseph out hoping that it would be a time for Joseph to bond with his brothers out while they were, out while they were tending flocks. It was probably more dangerous uh, for Joseph to be out there wandering around trying to find his brothers than it was uh, for his brothers who were a gang of many to be out there um, uh, tending, the, tending the sheep. But verse 18 says, But when they saw him in a distance, before, they, before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. He was still a long way off. How, how did they see him coming? That stinking coat he was wearing. Can you, can you, I, it, it just, it never ceases to amaze me. Last week we found Joseph failed the pride test. Here we find him failing it again. He's going out to meet his brothers. His father's setting this up to have some bonding time. And what is he doing? He's wearing that coat that they hated and despised. Right? And, and, he, and so he's going out to find his brothers. But again, he's going out in pride showing off that coat that he is the favorite, favorite son. Um, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a great point here that Joseph, um, Joseph had a father who loved him very much. And um, his father loved him so much he gave him this great gift, right? And one, one of the reasons he found himself in a pit a little bit later is because of the fact that he took this gift that his father given, given him and he sort of flaunted it. And I think that's a great lesson to us to remember that we have a father who loves us very, very, very much. And he has gifted us in this life. Whether you think you are gifted or not, you have giftings in your life. You have been blessed by your heavenly father in this, in this life. Um, and one of the surest ways to find ourselves in a pit in this life is to fall in love with the gifts that he's given us rather than him the giver. Um, or to begin to find ourselves showing off the gifts that He's given us rather than to use those gifts to point others 
to him. Um, his insecurity is what got him into trouble. And as we learned last week, he failed the, the pride test, and that's why he ended up in this, in this pit. Uh, second question to ask is, what is God's perspective on this pit? Um, and I think the reason that this is so important, as I said, some pits are pits of our own making. Some are, are, are pits that we just find ourselves in that maybe we are truly victims of. But, but, but think, about, think about this. No matter, no matter why you're in the pit, the first person that shows up when you're in the pit is Satan himself, right? The accuser of the brethren. And, and, and he always comes in and begins to condemn. He always comes in and, and begins to give you a flawed perspective about, about that pit. And in fact, you've probably heard it said, God will convict us, but, but Satan always comes to, to, to condemn us. Um, and, and, and we will find that kind of condemnation when we find ourselves in, the fit, uh, in, a, in a pit. Uh, God, God never condemns you. He, he will always convict you, uh, but condemnation is always, always from the devil. Conviction is specific. Uh, condemnation is, is general, right? And conviction is, is the Lord saying, hey, you did this, and I'm bringing it to your attention so that your heart might become repentant uh, to me. But condemnation says, hey, you're a bad person because you did this. You're a bad person. Uh, John 3.17 says that even Jesus didn't come to judge us, uh, but to save us. And so God's not in the condemning business, but He does, but he does convict us. One of the great lies in this, in this story uh, is found in verse 31 and 33. When they got Joseph's robe, they slaughtered a goat and dipped the, blood, uh, the, the robe in blood. Then they took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him, and Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Now, had a, had a wild beast destroyed Joseph? No. Um, in, in fact, his, his brothers, it's not even recorded that they ever told his, his, his father that. Now, they had planned in their mind for this, to, to, for this to look like it was the case, but they never even said this. They merely gave their father that robe with the, with the blood on it, and uh, their father took these, this fabricated evidence and, and came to his conclusion. And that's often how Satan will work in our life. Um, he, will, he, will fabricate, um, he will fabricate evidence, or he will... Uh, let you create a, a narrative that keeps you in the pit. For, an, uh, for instance, how many of you have ever had a, a pain in your body somewhere and you're like, oh God, I've got cancer. <laughs> you know, it, and, and you'll sit there and, and worry. You'll worry and worry and worry because you're sure that, that uh, you know, you've, you've got some kind of cancer in your body and, and when, it, when it's really just something, something minor. Uh, or... One of your teacher or one of your students are doing poorly in, in, in one of your classes, and and all of a sudden you're convincing yourself that you're a terrible teacher, uh, because the enemy the enemy will fabricate evidence or he will he will help, uh, put this stuff in our lives and we will create a narrative uh, that that many times will just put us in a in a pit, and so it's important that we get God's perspective. When, when we are in the pit. Um, and thirdly, and, and I believe the second sort of ties into the third here, when we get God's perspective in the pit, why, why are we really there? What's, what's really going on here? Uh, what's, what's really going on? Um, the, the third question becomes so, so important. What is God's purpose for this pit? I wonder if for the first little bit that Joseph was in this, in this uh, pit, he was just complaining about how bad his brothers were. Like he was complaining about all the bad things that they had done to him and, and just sort of kicking the side of that pit wall thinking, man, my brothers are just evil. My, my brothers are just terrible, terrible people. How could they have done this to me? But I, I believe at some point, when Joseph was in that pit, maybe, maybe it took him a little while, but he, he called out to God. 
Now, I, it doesn't say that in the story, but I, I just sort of have a feeling that that might have happened. And in verse 22, it says, Don't shed any blood. Throw them into the, throw them into the cistern, into the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on them. Reuben said, Reuben said this. Now, Reuben was the oldest brother, right? He is the one that should have had the favor of, of Israel or Jacob upon his life. He was the older, oldest brother. Uh, but he said, he said this to deliver him out of their hands and take him back uh, to, his, to his father. And, and I, I, believe, I believe that the purpose of every pit in life is, is the same. Listen, listen to this verse. Throw, he, he, don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness. Don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to deliver him out of their hands and to take him back uh, to, his, to his father. I believe the purpose of every pit is to get us to call out on God that, he might, or that, that we might be delivered and that we might come back to the father. Just, just like in, in the case of Joseph, that we might call out on God, that we might be delivered from this, from this time and, and, and come back to the Father. Um, there's a great psalm that, that, that I absolutely love, uh, Psalm 107. And I encourage you to go read the entire psalm sometime. It's, it's, just, it's just an amazing, an amazing psalm. But, but four times, four times in this psalm, we are given this story of some people who find themselves in sort of one of the great pits of life. And they, they find themselves in a bad place. And, it, and it, gives us this, it gives us four different stories, but they all come down to the same, the same end. Uh, listen, I'll just read the last one in verse 23. That they go down into the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These, these see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. For He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like drunken men. And they are at their wit's end. Any of you ever been at your wit's end? I, some of you didn't know that was a real thing, right? But here it is. The Bible created the wit's end. Uh, you're, you're at your wit's end. Like you don't know what to do. Your mind is so confused and just burnt out. You don't know what you're going to do or what's coming next. Their wit's end. And this is how every one of these four illustrations in Psalm 107 ends. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And He brings them out of their distresses. Sorry for putting this in there in the King James Version. And He bringeth them out of their distresses and maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then they are glad because they, be, that because they are quiet. So He bringeth them unto the desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and His wonderful works for the children of men. All of these stories find someone in a pit someone in a bad situation. They call out to the Lord. He delivers them and restores them into relationship with their Heavenly Father. And God wants to do the same for you. If you find yourself in a pit today, you can pass that pit test. You can determine. You can determine to ask the right questions, to have a proper perspective, to learn God's purpose. And I promise you, you'll find yourself out of that, that pit a lot quicker. If you'll call out to God, sooner rather than later. Let Him deliver you and let your heart return to the Father and His purposes for your life. Let's pray. God, we love You. And we thank You, Lord, even in the hard times, even in the times of life where we find ourselves in pits that are no fun, that are hard, that are discouraging, <laughs> um, perhaps even having a, a flawed perspective in the, middle of, or in the midst of a pit where we blame others or where we... Uh, are, are believing a false narrative that, that Satan has declared over our lives. Lord, we, we, we at times find ourselves in those pits. But God, we commit ourselves today, any time that we are in one of these pits, to call out upon You, to let Your hand deliver us, O oh God, and that let our heart, our hope, and our faith be restored to our Heavenly Father. We love You and we thank You for it in Your strong name. 
Amen. Bless you guys.